I thought we would begin with, um, with the health of the energy sector, generally speaking. Uh, uh, Chairman Craddock, the, uh, the employment numbers came out this morning for the state of Texas for the month of January. And while the state overall gained something like 20,000 jobs, the energy sector lost about 3,000 jobs. We've been treated, and not in a good way, over the last few weeks to news stories about Schlumberger and Baker Hughes and other people in the oil business uh, hemorrhaging, there's no other way to say it, at least at the moment, hemorrhaging uh, jobs. Uh, and I go to the pump now and I pay less than $2 a barrel, and while you think that would make me happy, I actually weep because I know that the health of the economy in the state of Texas in some ways is tied to the health of the energy sector. Can you give us a, a curative, a palliative here, help us feel better about where we are? Well, first and foremost, I always say, um, and I will say, by the way, I didn't come to the business school very often unless I was going to the library to meet the guys, so I'm glad to be here. <laughs> um, the, the, it was always intimidating, although, to come to the business school, so I'm, as, but y'all have way nicer counsel, so I'm coming uh -huh. back for that. My liberal <laughs> arts deal is about half this. Um, no, you know, I think one, you have to remember that oil is an international commodity and we are in a business cycle. And oil is in a good business cycle. And in fact, I think it's a five year business cycle and we're year four. And there are normal ups and downs, but I think we're well positioned as the business comes back, uh, Texas specifically because of the infrastructure, because of our business climate here uh, to be well situated. And while we don't like to see people lose jobs by any means, we also know that there needs to be a reset occasionally. And if you'd actually talk to people in West Texas when oil was 100, they would tell you the service sector was priced too high. And, and in fact, in Midland, uh, 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 Chairman, uh, I heard last year from people, we are not going to get out over our skis on this. We're not going to do what we did the last time, in quotes. We're not going to uh, get so heady about the boom and overbuild and do all this stuff that would then cause us to, to fall farther if things indeed go go south. They, they were pretty careful about that. That's right. Right. Um, uh, Ambassador, you have the perspective of somebody who served as uh, Chairman Craddock did on the Railroad Commission, focused on this stuff every day, but you've also had a few years, more than mm -hmm. a few years out of it, right. to observe from a very different perspective um, uh, the, the health of the energy sector. From, from your side of, of, of this, what, how would you perceive what's going on right now? Well, I think when I, when I went on the commission in 98, I don't know that all was, it may have been trading somewhere between 16 and $20 at the time, and there was a lot of concern that, that perhaps uh, we no longer had the kind of influence in the global politics, and OPEC wasn't listening, and they weren't doing the sorts of things that, that we, we felt were necessary to move price a little bit north. Uh, that's one data point. The other was when I left in 2002, I think there were all the seven permits issued in Eagleford. And as prices moved north and encouraged innovation and encouraged exploration, you saw some really remarkable things happen. Yeah. And I guess a third, just to put this in perspective, I remember when oil hitting $45, $50, $50 a fellow uh, East Texas, Curtis Mewborn, he says, boy, up at these prices, there's a lot of amateurs that get into the game. And so to, to uh, Christie's observation about this is what markets do, uh, at certain prices, you, you encourage innovation and production, uh, and at, you know, in downturns, you, you get a sense of who the really solid operators are. Uh, in Mexico, Mexico, curiously, they're, they're opening up their energy sector in the sense that they did the right thing at the wrong time. You know, here they are opening up, encouraging uh, yeah. investment, and the time looks very challenging. Yet, sitting with a group of energy people in, in Mexico yesterday and regulators, they say, curiously, you know, what, what we're getting is the kind of interest from uh, operators and large companies that are looking th at this as a long-term play. Right. And, and these are the kind of companies that we really want uh, as the sector opens up. We don't want speculators. We don't want people that are flying in at, you know, at these incredible prices and thinking they're going to make a big buck. So, you know, there are some, 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 some ups and downs, but I think we're, uh, you know, as I look back over this last 10 or 15 years, this, this is what markets do. Yep. Uh, they, they exact efficiencies, and there are times when, you know, uh, they're going to expose those that were, that were speculating. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ch Chairman, the Ambassador is absolutely right. This is a marathon and not a sprint. That's right. Right. Bo both in terms of the people in the oil business and the communities that are benefiting from it. There's, there's long-term perspective mm -hmm. that's necessary here. There is, and I think we're better positioned than North Dakota, for instance, right. because they have a lot of speculators in North Dakota, right. and they're really, and that's what their whole economy is built under. So you talk about statewide numbers. We, our economy is still very, very strong because we've diversified first and foremost. Yep. But if you're in 
Houston, they're feeling a little bit of heartburn. If you're in Midland, you're feeling some right. heartburn. But overall, the state is well is in good shape. And right. so I think that's a good thing we've diversified. In fact, to the point in North Dakota, the comparison is interesting. So I, I looked at the unemployment numbers uh, uh, for the entire country to see where various cities ranked in, in, in their uh, unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. Midland, last I was able to get, not based on this new information, Midland I thought was had the third lowest unemployment right. rate in the entire country. But the lowest and the second lowest were both North Dakota. And because of their relative lack of experience at this, not the experience that we have, they may be worse positioned because they may be fooled into believing that this is going to last forever and we, and we know better. Right. Right. And in talking to the mayor of Midland back in the fall, and he was talking about, you know, signing bonuses to come to work for companies and McDonald's and other, uh, you know, kind of more traditional consumer facing businesses paying, you know, $15 an hour to get help because it was so hard to hire people. There may be some resetting of, of that, but generally speaking, Midland's not going to fall off the end of the earth if we have a little bit of a downturn. No. Yeah, no, because they, they, they've insulated themselves. They have. Um, Ambassador, you talked about the Mexican energy markets opening up and mm -hmm. the fact that maybe it's not the best time right now. The reality is six or eight months ago, it looked like the right time. And for all we know, it may be the case in six or eight months that it was the right time af after all. People are not getting, well, cold. I, yeah, They're yeah. not getting cold feet about it. No, I don't think there's any cold feet. And really, you know, it, look, this was an industry that was a, a nationalized for 80 years. Right. Uh, the right time has been about the last 80 years <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to open it up to investment and start to build the infrastructure and these sorts of things. So, you know, there's no wrong time to do the right thing. Right. Perhaps in terms of the Amen. overall market, yeah, maybe six months, eight months, a, a year ago, it looked better from... Uh, from the perspective of the government, but in a way, just the fact that there are that, that they're working with much smaller margins for error, uh, the fact that they are under uh, you know, real pressure to get this done right, to uh, you know, about a third of their budget is based on oil revenues of their public uh, public expenditures. Right, they've got some real urgency, so now they've they've got to open it up in a way that is competitive. I think you have a more balanced negotiation on the bidding of these contracts between the operators and the government now. And, and I think it's ultimately uh, right. going to be a good thing. They're also under some real pressure from the standpoint of doing it transparently. transparently. Right. Uh, Mexico has, has had some challenges with respect to uh, corruption and rule right. of law. And the, the presumption, the Ambassador, is not in favor of everything being on the up and up, let's acknowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but I think in the current market, and uh, with these openings, and, and they recognize that you know th they've got to be more transparent, and they've yeah. got to do it in a way that is on the up and up. Or they're not going to get the participation from the types of companies that they need to right. uh, attract investment. Now, with regard to governments, let's talk about our government rather than the Mexican government, Chairman. You know, uh, t Texas, I like to say, was Tenth Amendment before Tenth Amendment was cool. Um, we, we've been pushing back against the federal government longer than just about any other state. That's practically our brand right now. And certainly, as you think about how the energy market in Texas operates, you've got to look both above and below from the state perspective. You've got to look up to the federal government to see what the federal government is or is not messing with. And you've got to look now increasingly down at cities like Denton mm -hmm. attempting to control at the local level activities. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's talk about the federal government. So what is the federal government doing, if anything, that is impeding the energy market in Texas right now or what could the federal government be doing that it's not doing to help the energy market in Texas right now? Federal government would be nice if they'd just stay out. So you want them gone completely? I think that would be the biggest plus for us. Because look, when you look at the Railroad Commission, and Tony and I both have sat there, we are the preeminent oil and gas regulator in the country. I think we still continue right. to be. Not, notwithstanding the name of your commission. Notwithstanding, well, that's a legislative question. I understand that. Not my question. It's a legislative peace, question. Peace. So, uh, but and if you talk to one Craddock, he has one story, and the other one has another story right. potentially. I'm so talking to this one. This Craddock says it's a legislative question. Okay, fine. Uh, so you know, look, we really think we have done it well and have been a leader for a long time at the Railroad Commission. And so when you ask what the federal government is doing or could do, and it's not just a Texas question; it's a U.S. question. There are now 34 states that have oil and gas, some component of oil and gas in them. It's the largest number ever. So everybody has an opportunity to grow, to, to create jobs like we are in Texas, and to ha have a, an opportunity for energy to be in their sector. But where the federal government potentially is causing problems is overregulation. So a good example is this. 
Bureau of Land Management, and when you talk about Texas being unto its own, remember we were a state, a country before we were a state. So we kept a lot of our own lands. We only have 5% of our land is, is federal land, which makes us unique and easier to deal with. The production numbers have gone up across the country in private lands and down 25% in federal lands. So the best example of federal interference, one of them is, the difference between the Railroad Commission getting a permit out and Bureau of Land Management on federal lands. Bureau of Land Management takes 290 days to get a drilling permit out. The Railroad Commission takes two. That's a huge difference when you're doing a business plan, for instance. Yep. Uh, EPA is another challenge as far as air emissions, them talking about putting fracking rules already uh, on top of other fracking rules, which most Western states historically have had rules in place for drilling and other things. So yep. over-regulation is our biggest challenge with the feds. Now, as you, let me, please, please, just yeah, to, I wish, to this please. point, because I, I think the, uh, and this is not so much a devil's advocate, but just a cautionary note. I think the best way to keep the federal government at bay is to have a robust regulatory body at the state level, one that, that, that truly does its job. Yeah. And I think the current commission is doing a good job. And, and at various times in, in the uh, commission's history, they've done, it, done a good job. But there, there's a natural tension there, I think, that we have to all acknowledge that as a railroad commission in the state of Texas, as an elected official, you're largely uh, uh, out there running as an advocate for the industry and then turning around and your job is to regulate the industry. And right. I think that, that breeds a certain sort of uh, cynicism about whether or not we can truly right. do our job. Per right? Perceived so, conflict of interest. Per perceived yeah. conflicts of interest. I think, you know, we've, I think the commission's done a very good job, but it's the kind of thing that we have right. to, to, to be robust in our sort of approaches and diligent in regulating, because people yeah. want to know what's going into the, right. what's going into that hole. Fracking may be a great thing. It's, it, it, it's created tremendous opportunities for production, but, but really, if you ask people on a gut level, they're a lot more concerned about the, 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 the quality and the care of the aquifers than they are production necessarily. Right. So we, we, you know, we do our job well at the, at the state level. That's the best argument against right. the uh, federal intrusion. Uh, to, to this question of Washington, D.C., let me stay with that for a second, Ambassador. You've been part of a presidential administration. Mm -hmm. Is Washington, D.C. all that bad? Answer it from inside an administration. You know, we, we, have, we have been, uh, have been smash-mouth talking Washington, D.C. for 15 or 20 years, whichever party has been in control. Is it all that bad, really? Well, my, my, own, my own experience was a very limited one, dealing with the State Department, Mexico, Western Hemisphere, during an administration, uh, President Bush that was very committed to, to Latin America, and yep. I think assembled a very good team. So I, I had a very good relationship with Washington, uh, both from the Security Council and the State Department, these sorts of things. So, so my personal experience was good. I will tell you, when, when trying to talk to Washington about issues related to Mexico, when I spend time on, in, in Congress, yeah. Uh, the Medida Initiative, talking about security and these sorts of things, or trying to have a, a conversation about immigration. Washington proved to be very frustrating, and yeah. that's not a, a commentary on one side or, you know, Democrat or Republican. So it you're just, saying Washington, but you to, mean in that case Congress. Congress, yeah, Congress proved, proved to right. be very, very frustrating, but my experience with the executive on yeah. the issues that I was dealing with was actually pretty good. So do you think the state on energy, and I'll ask Chairman Craddock the same thing, or on any other issue should be in active conversation with the federal government. There's, there seems to be, of late, a talking point out of this legislature, this particular, 84th, mm -hmm. these members of the legislature, that we should not even be talking to the federal government. Not that we shouldn't be submitting to their will or, you know, or kind of turning over control of various things, health care or energy, that we shouldn't even be talking to the federal government. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think on energy, on any number of issues, if you look, and this just, you know, from, from, from a perspective of still living in Mexico and, and recognizing things like the Keystone Pipeline, the Canadian stuff, I think really there is only one uh, uh, level of government, and it's federal, that right. can really, I think, have a conversation or take leadership in terms of the integration of energy markets, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and that's right. not going to be something that's done at the state level. And if you take a step back, and you and I have had this conversation yeah. about North America, and you look at, at, at what the stakes are when you have 500 million people, a quarter of the world's GDP, three relatively stable democracies, and moving in the right direction, and, and, and they're complementary in terms of, of energy and resources, that's, that's, that's an issue that I would like to see the federal government take some leadership yeah. on. 
but it's not one that I've seen leadership on because yeah. some of these issues get tied up in domestic politics, i.e. the pipeline. But that, uh, you know, that is an area where uh, I would like to see the federal government showing more leadership. Right. I, I'm afraid that typically they haven't. Commissioner, are you eager to have a conversation with the federal government, if only to tell them politely and in person, we don't want you messing in our business? Or is your attitude effectively talk to the hand when the government comes, come, comes, comes by to talk to you? We don't have a talk to the hand attitude at the commission, by the way. Um, we work with the EPA, actually the EPA administrator for, for six, which is um, in region six, which is in Dallas, we have conversations that's back still Ron, and forth. That's still Ron Curry? Who is the, what's the name of the person, the EPA person here? I just can't remember. <laughs> I think it's Ron uh, Curry. I think right. it's Ron Curry. He's yeah. been there for like two, three years. Yeah. Um, but, but we do have conversations back and forth. I've been up to Congress. We talk to our congressmen. Look, energy is a nonpartisan issue. So, and Texas has good congressmen, actually, who go to D.C. and talk about energy in a nonpartisan way. And so I've been up and testified. We yep. think there's good conversations back and forth. The biggest challenge you have, in my opinion, about energy, when you look from state to state or Texas, just in Texas, regulating one size fits all on energy or any policy, but particularly energy policy, doesn't work well. Because Texas, I joke, is about eight or nine different states to regulate when you're yep. writing a rule. So how can EPA, whoever, whatever agency, write a rule that is one size fits all? It doesn't work well. And that's where I think, and, and our policy and the way we do rules at the commission is a little bit different than how federal agencies do rules. They're looking for a problem and then they want to address it. We want to be in front of the problem so we're writing rules ahead of time right. to have best practices in place. So to that point, unlike healthcare, say, where a number of people in Texas are saying, look, we hope we're going to have a Republican president in 2016, so let's run out the clock between now and then and hope that we get a change. You're not waiting for a potential new president in 2016 to be elected. Uh, you're going to continue to work however you have to work in these next two years. We're working well with them, a new president in 2016 who actually liked energy and understood it in a philosophy that Texas understands it. Are you, opti you optimistic about that? Now, I this don't is have an answer to that. But Republican I do Victory Committee hat on? No, I do think here, look, Texas is a good model for what energy policy could be in the country, right? right? We have nuclear power, we have coal power, we have natural gas, we have solar, and we have wind. We're the largest wind energy state in right. the country. We are a good model, but you, but having one versus the other, picking a winner is a, is a bad policy long term right. in energy, I believe. Right. So we're a good policy, and we want to export our model to other states. Right. Now, I mentioned this was essentially a two front war that you're doing. There's the kind of up, the, what might be called the air war with the federal government. The ground war is with some of these communities. You know, as you know, the two big takeaways on election day in Texas were that Denton banned fracking and Texas banned Democrats, effectively. Um, uh, the Denton fracking ban. We talk, got to talk about that just a couple days after the election. We sat down together at the Austin Club, and you said at the time that you believed there would be some action either at the commission or at the legislature or wherever it was determined it was possible to overturn the will of those voters in Denton. Mm -hmm. You still believe that's the right course to pursue? The legislature's talking about it a lot. Um, we're following it at the commission. We haven't taken a direction that we're going. Look, when you've got a, a group of voters who vote, you want to respect those voters, obviously. Um, but I think the challenge is what do cities themselves um, and the personnel at cities, do they have the expertise to be able to do what they're trying to do? And does banning fracking really do what the community wants? Their, their concerns when you listen to Denton is noise, pollution, and traffic. None of the three of which the commission has anything to do with and none of the three of which banning fracking solves for them. Right. So I think the, leg the legislature has several bills that they filed um, to see who has, you know, who should be doing that right. job. Of course, maybe we could just ban uneducated voters. That would be yeah. a really good thing. No, but you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to bash a voter because I don't think that's a fair statement. Mm. I think the real challenge is this. And it happens really for us in Texas in the Barnett Show, but it's any community in the, in the country. You don't understand drilling. You don't understand what it means. And right. so an education process, and it can't start and stop. It needs to be a long-term communication process, one from an agency, so people understand we're actually out there inspecting, right. drilling, paying attention to what's going on, fining people if they don't follow the rules. But also, oil and gas, frankly, has done a very poor job in this country telling their story. 
So and that's I tell a, them that. part of this is on the, the industry side and not adequately explaining what's really going on I think that's in these right. communities. Tony, I want to ask you again, as somebody who's a veteran of politics and a veteran of these wars, but also is, is out of these wars by and large mm -hmm. now, I don't want to just say this is the Republican Party, but largely politics does a lot of talking about local control. Right. And this is the tension that we're seeing right now in Texas. It seems like we only like local control up until the point that the locals control things in a way that we don't agree with. Mm -hmm. So we want you to have local control except if you ban fracking or except if you ban plastic bags or except if you vote as a community to increase the, state's, the sales tax by a quarter of a, or an eighth of a, of a cent to fund pre-K. We, it, it, it's not local control if it's only local control when I agree with it. Right. So that, that's the argument from Denton and from the people who support the fracking ban is, look, you wanted the voters to decide to self-determine, they self-determine. What do you do about that? Well, it, it, it's, it's a tough one. And, and I will tell you that, and I was one of those guys that ran around the state talking about that government which governs best is that which closest to the people, and it's right. all good to say that, and I, and I meant it. Uh, until I'd run smack dab into 2% turnouts or a percent and a half turnout in many of these local races. And you say, well, this is actually a very small slice uh, of people. And so, yeah, I, I support the notion of local autonomy and control, but at the same time, I think the burden has to fall on the citizenry to participate. And if the issue is a controversial one, then it also falls on, on, on the shareholder, whether it be an energy company. I mean, because this is also always generally a variation of not in my backyard. Or if I'm not the one directly benefited, uh, I'm opposed to this. Right. But it falls on all of us as communities to, to, to actually participate and the industry to encourage the participation. Because I will tell you, having, having sat in, in, uh, in sessions with business now, I said, listen, why are we going to rile these folks up if we're going to get a percentage and a half turnout and we're going to get what we want because we can motivate a slice of voters? Yeah. So it's one of these things, Evan, that you come back to. No, there's no easy response, but there is an enormous responsibility that we all have as members of community to just participate right. and be, be more involved. Of course, in Chairman, community. again, you were head of the Republican Victory Committee and you all did just fine last time, but the reality is over the last three election cycles to the Ambassador's point, Texas is dead last in voter turnout. That's right. yeah. 51st in 2010, 48th in tw 2012, 49th in, in, in 2014, 49th. Molly Ivers used to say we're Mississippi with better roads. If she were here, she would say we're Indiana with better voter turnout, as they mm -hmm. were 50th, right? I mean, we, we don't have a whole lot to be proud of in the Civic Participation Department, and the ambassador is absolutely right, but in some ways what he's talking about is the ideal here. If only we could get more people to turn out. People have stakes in these issues, but they seem not to know it. That's right. So what do we do? I don't know the answer to that. I really don't know the answer. I think education is a big piece of it. Yeah. And you, but you can't motivate people to, to care about these issues if they're just not going to care about them, right? You can't motivate people to vote if you can't get them to vote. As, as you well know. So do you think in the end, by the end of this session, the Denton fracking ban will be in place? I don't know the right answer yet. I don't know what the bill is to know what the right answer you is. Have a, you have a personal preference. The personal preference is I think it's better overall for the state if the, and, and I agree with local control too, I think we all do, but as local as you can get it who still have the expertise. And that's my biggest concern is do cities have expertise? Do they have, I mean, do they have expertise to go um, know what a hydraulic fracturing is, to go um, know how to regulate that piece when you have an agency who has that expertise? Right. So, uh, you know, I think the, when the legislature's in town, you always defer to them and let them figure out what they're going to do first. And, and uh, there's a lot of conversation going on between cities and yeah. oil and gas and the legislature. I'm not sure that cities necessarily know what they got into when they decided to right. take this on. Do you, you think know, the, I, yeah. I have no idea where this will play out, but I, I think it, it, it's instructive in this sense. It, it'll, it'll get worked out. There will not be a ban, is my, is, is, is my guess, and largely because it took this loggerhead. It took an angry community doing something that was perceived right. as visceral for the industry to p feel as though they were threatened and get, get the players at the table actually yeah. discussing now what, what's, a, what's a practical right. yeah. sort of workout on this where, where right. these concerns about noise and whatever right. the other ones are, are actually addressed. That's unfortunate. It's a, it's a little bit like motivating voters. You know, maybe the, you, 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 you can t make the argument that folks don't vote because they're generally content. 
You know, there's nothing that motivates more than being angry. Well, anger is a great motivator. Do we want, do, do we want people in a perpetual right. state of anger? Well, right. which means they're pretty upset with their with their yeah. leadership. Maybe yeah. maybe a lot of folks stay home because they think it's not so bad, and and, and actually it isn't. So Chairman, bad. let me come at this from the other side. So. The, the, what might have motivated people to ban fracking, correctly or incorrectly to begin with. Th there is a perception, fairly or unfairly, in this state right now that we're on the verge with our economic success over the last number of years of being victims of that success. That we've grown so quickly, we're adding 1,000 people a day to the state's population over the last two years. Census numbers just came out. We have four of the five fastest growing cities, period, in the country. Four of the five fastest growing big cities in the country. But all those people coming from other states, are not bringing public education with them. They're not bringing health care with them. They're not bringing water with them. They're not bringing asphalt with them. Many of the communities that have been growing the fastest in Texas, including many that have seen enormously good times economically through energy, are really straining under the available physical and social infrastructure resources. So whose obligation is it to address those? First of all, do you think it's legitimate for people to be concerned about water, air quality, roads, emergency responders, all those issues? And then whose responsibility is it to come behind and try to fill in some of that infrastructure that may be lacking? Well, one, I think high growth is a plus. It means you're doing something right in the state. You've got a good business culture where we have infrastructure challenges. And, um, and part of that is education, infrastructure, roads, water, uh, all of the infrastructure challenges. But I'd rather have that challenge than a no growth state that yeah. is not going any place. Yeah. So I, I think that means we've got a good business culture. People want to do business here. We have good education. We can always raise it up. We're sitting on one of the preeminent university campuses. People are coming because they see real, real opportunity in Texas. Right. That's a plus for us. I would rather have that than other states that aren't growing at all. Right. So what one, and, and you ask whose job it is, I think partly, again, legislature gets to figure part of that out. Yeah. Um, but communities, I think, need to educate themselves and be engaged. And I think businesses, when you look, are engaged with helping those communities rise up as well. So if you talk to people in South Texas, they will tell you that oil and gas companies go down and help and give them dollars to make sure they're putting roads in place, for instance, or get engaged in their school bond elections because they want their schools to come up a level or two because they're living in those communities. So I think businesses and people in the state are involved in those processes as well. Okay, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna do about 10 more minutes of conversation, by the way, and then we'll have some questions from the audience. But I want you to w w weigh in on this. I'm, I'm okay. thinking about all these years, Ambassador, of Governor Perry traveling around the country, pickpocketing businesses from other states doing so successfully, you know, mm -hmm. net job growth in the state of Texas over the last 15 years better than the other 49 states combined, in large part by selling low taxes, predictable regulation, and tort yeah. reform as, as measures of kind of economic development, uh, uh, carrots. But lately, in the last couple of years, he heard, yes, but what about your water? Yes, but what about yeah. your roads? So where do you square this for me? Well, I hope there are no more salads on the table because this is the tomato moment. Uh, <laughs> I think, given where we're headed as a state, the demographics, the growth, the challenges, there are moments, uh, and perhaps in the current environment where oil prices are, they are, it doesn't feel like a dividend moment, but for the last four or five years, we've been living one. And I, and I really think that as a state, we're gonna have to take a step back and say, okay, this is one of those moments where we have to look out and say, where, 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 where have we failed to invest? Whether it's, it's higher ed, whether it's uh, reinvesting in the infrastructure of the state, whether it's thinking about water and moving beyond sort of the, the east-west Texas kind of uh, challenge that we, it's, it's, it's gonna take some real leadership. It's gonna take, uh, I think, a state willing to experience some discomfort. Uh, but if you look at the growth in this state, I, I don't know that we've really kept pace. We've done, we've done a lot of wonderful things to make ourselves attractive for investment and create a good growth climate. Yeah. But I come from a part of the state that I think uh, along the border where we've seen what happens when you grow too quickly and you don't invest in right. building capacity where you don't have your schools keeping up, where you don't have your roads keeping up, where you don't ha aren't building the infrastructure to do the international trade, where your higher ed is constantly playing catch up and your population is way out ahead of it. In, in, in a variation on that same thing that we've seen along the border, I think many communities across the state are now experiencing yeah. it. So I think there are times when you have to say, boy, it felt good to say, you know, we're gonna cut those taxes again, again we're gonna send this surplus back to the people of the state. We're gonna, 
look, I feel as good as anybody. I want that money back in my pocket. But at the same time, I, I think we have to look smart about what are we doing to, to yeah. invest in our own future. Well, you've just actually pivoted very helpfully to the border because I want to ask a question or two about, about that. I mentioned to you that I was in Edinburgh, McAllen, Harlingen, Brownsville over the last couple of days of last week, and I talked to a bunch of people about the very thing you're describing, which is <clears throat> the state's population is growing precipitously. I think the numbers that came out yesterday said we're going to double our population by 2050 to almost 55 million Texans. Much of the growth is happening in the valley. Mm -hmm. It is where the population is growing fast and also changing dynamically. But the valley, and not just the valley, is a place where we have underinvested historically in roads, physical, uh, physical infrastructure of all sorts, public education, health care, broadband. And those chickens are now coming home to roost in the sense that those communities are, are buckling up under it. What do we do to bring the valley and El Paso, for that matter, and other communities along the border into the statewide conversation. Because if you talk to people down there, the first thing they say is, we are constantly disrespected and neglected by Austin. We don't get ours. And we want ours, and we need ours, and the state's future depends on it. What do you do about that? Uh, you're, you're, you're from Cameron you're, County. You're about like, you're, Ambassador. Your area. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Well, look. Uh, you're not running again. Tell the truth. Well, look, look I, I think a lot. There's a couple of things that, we, that we've touched on. One is, is uh, it, it was easy to overlook a part of the state that simply didn't participate in elections. Yep. Our, our turnouts were historically amongst the worst. Uh, still not so great. St still not so great. I think, secondly, it was uh, e easy, if you will, to, to kind of take, take our eye off the ball. When you, when you looked at the, at the border, you saw growth. And, and I don't think the state, and I'm going to put a little bit on the leadership of the state, quite appreciated what the impact of being truly being on the border was. I mean, if you had 100,000 people in, in, in Brownsville, you had half a million in Matamoros. I mean, that, that creates a dynamic there that, yep. that I think w w people simply didn't uh, appreciate. And maybe, w without being too hard on, on the current group, but I think maybe we didn't do as good a job from our perspective along the border in educating and selling the notion of what we needed uh, in South Texas. By the, the current group, you mean current Republicans in charge? No, just, just our, 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 our leadership. Current Which leadership of both, of both parties. I think improved by a lot. I, I, I think I, the leadership has improved. The, that, right. That's where I right. think they're finally in the conversation for the first time yeah, in the I last think, 10 I years. I think increasingly. So I'm not going to lay it all on, on, on Austin or D.C or lay it all on the leadership in, in, along the border. But I think there were a lot of things going on that people failed to appreciate and weren't communicating very right. well. Uh, Chairman, uh, you point out very correctly that the conversation has become um, uh, more robust in the Valley. Uh, General Abbott got 44% of the Latino vote statewide. He actually won Latino men outright in this last election. This is just two years after Mitt Romney got 27% of the vote, second worst in the last 30 years of the Latino vote nationally in a presidential election. And it was said that Republicans would never be able to compete successfully for the Latino vote. But in fact, it's become a two-party conversation in the Valley. That's got to have an impact, right? I think it does. Well, look, I don't think you can pigeonhole just because you're Latino, Latina. You don't pigeonhole you. That doesn't mean you're going to vote one way. If you're, you, you right. and I are both live in Austin, we don't vote the same way and, just And the fact is the, the Anglo community is no more monolithic at election right. time than the Latino That's community. That's right. So I right. think yeah. that, that for the first time really in this last site, in the last 10 years, and I think it has been 10 year, the last 10 years, valley leadership of all parties, it doesn't matter what party you're in, have come up and started really having conversations with Austin, but they've also invited people who live in Austin and work in Austin meaning leadership, down to the valley. And I think we've all gone. I've gone multiple times. There is real opportunity and conversations to be had in the valley. Uh, so I think we're all interested in going back and forth across the state and figuring out how to work together because if that, that part of the state doesn't come up with the rest of us, then we're losing overall as a state. So I think that's what finally that, that recognition in the last 10 years. Yeah. Tour reform, frankly, was a big piece of that. 
Interestingly, the valley has really grown and prospered because of tort reform. They now have doctors that are down there that want to stay, which they were losing doctors and didn't have primary care doctors in the valley. With tort reform, that is improved. I'm not saying it's 100%, I'm saying it's improved. Energy is another real opportunity. Everybody along the border, from El Paso to Brownsville, are all excited about what could happen in Mexico, frankly, and what's happening in the Eagle Fort. Everybody wants a piece of it. They see jobs and opportunity. And so I, I, I say energy is a great equalizer when you have a conversation with people. They see a job opportunity. They know they have to have energy to be successful, right. water the same. So, um, so I think the Valley has really become more of a part of the conversation. Partly because they've made the effort, but also I think it's, yeah. it's now a two-way street for the and, first time. And as a practical matter, I think uh, along that entire border, uh, pe people that vote or people, the consumers of politics, realize that they are better served by 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 a healthy two-party kind uh, yep. uh, political system. And and just on a very basic level, you tend to reject scandal if you if you have it. And the Democrats. Well, in fact, your first election as county judge yep. in Cameron uh, County yeah, came right. after a scandal. Right. My first opponent was had been indicted on a murder for hire against a fellow yes, sitting I county commissioner. Yes, I, I would call that a scandal. And he was, and he was presumptively the, the you know, the, the favorite. Right. And so, yeah, it's uh, right. Okay. So why is it, why is immigration reform uh, stalled, or why does it seem to be stalled? We seem to have been talking about it for some time. There seems to be general agreement we have to do something, but we we can't seem to get anything done. And this gets back to the what you just said about Congress and about the executive, the inability of people to work together, we seem not to be able to get on the same page on this. What's going to happen? Give us your, 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 your perspective on how this is going to get resolved. Uh, Im immigration is one of those issues that I think frustrates a lot of us uh, in the country because if you look at how it polls and you look at what the, quote, the average American, uh, the, the desire is to have comprehensive immigration reform. And those numbers are up in the 60s and 70s, a, a desire to have an uh, uh, immigration reform bill that moves people into the mainstream and that addresses a lot of our, our, uh, our uh, market needs and this sorts of things. The problem, I think, in Washington is that it's not a mainstream issue. It's a niche issue that motivates and, and uh, uh, small constituencies within each of the parties. Both, both sides. But yeah. both sides right. and, and in an extreme way. And so it's just not an issue that lends itself yeah. to the kind of, of uh, congressional makeup we have. And, uh, you know, it, it's a tough one. I, I, think it, I think it's one of those three or four cycle issues, quite frankly, and we're into about the third. I mean, Bush in 2006 had right. a comprehensive initiative. I think uh, this president at various times, he appears to have had shown an interest in the issue. Uh, but I, I think it's may, may, it may go to the next president. And some of it's going to be as practical as Republicans realizing that they need to poll better within the uh, Latino community and Democrats staying uh, or, or perhaps stiff arming a, a bit traditional labor constituencies within the Democrat Party. There yeah. are no innocents here. They're just uh, kind of micro constituencies right. that are that are very, uh, very loud. Within yeah, everybody's parties. got crosses to bear on yeah. All right, so let's, uh, uh, you know, it's an intimate room. I don't know that we have a microphone. We, are, we do have, oh, bless you, that's great. So we're going to walk microphones around, put your hands up. We'll try to get as many in as we can. We're going to not make this go longer than it wants to organically. But if you have questions on any subject we've touched on or ones we have not touched on, please raise your hand. Sir. Uh, hello, uh, Ambassador. Uh, you were talking about uh, Mexico now opening the oil and gas, right? And mm -hmm. you talked about corruption, and I guess there was a correlation, and I was wondering in your perspective how corruption in this moment, in this opening of the oil and gas industry in Mexico is going to impact. Right. And, and, how, does, and how does this particular, let me layer on top of that very good question, how does this particular version of the Mexican government compare to others you've seen in the corruption department? Well, I'll answer both from the perspective of the government and, and people going to Mexico, which is how I'm typically asked. From the perspective of the Mexican government, I think they're certainly in the energy opening. And if you look at the legislation, there's been a lot of, quote, safeguards put in place to, to assure that you don't have the, the, what people perceive as a traditional approach to doing business in Mexico, right? It's, it's kind of who you know and who you're, who you're taking care of. 
Secondly, I think there's also a recognition in the country right now that, that in order to, to, to grow and to truly be competitive, that whether it be the energy reform, fiscal labor, or any of the others, that if you don't have an underpinning of rule of law and you don't have, uh, and you're not addressing security, you've really uh, made it difficult for this implementation to go forward and to grow the country the way you need to. So I, th I think the government r actually recognizes. From the standpoint of, of uh, doing business in Mexico, I have to say that, that I think the environment's very good and I think you're gonna find it relatively uh, transparent. At the same time, I think my counsel to, to business is to do your diligence, know your partners, uh, and, and set, in, set in place a very robust compliance uh, 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 mechanism within your company. Because if you look at the areas that uh, DOJ typically focus on, it's large resources, large resource plays in emerging markets with, you know, privatization on the offing. And, and uh, it, it's, 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 it's as favorable an emerging market with an opening in a resource as you're gonna see anywhere in the world. Uh, but that doesn't mean it is any more pristine than, let's say, Stark County. Right. So. Boy, if you're going to use a benchmark, Stark <laughs> County is not a bad one, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty low hurdle to get over. Uh, looks like the dean, unless somebody else, I, I respect. I have a question. Uh, my, my question is on electric deregulation in Texas. In 99, we allegedly deregulated electricity in Texas. But of course we all know 70% of the people supposedly get deregulated prices at the retail level in Texas, but all the co-ops in the municipalities, including Austin Energy, is not deregulated. Uh, the Pertinalis Electric Co-op, who I'm familiar Mr. Smith is, he won't write about it. Only co-op in the nation has two convicted felons, one the general counsel and one the CEO. So what's, your, so what's your question? I'm, I'm going to I'm question, gonna write what do you see? Is anything going to happen in this? Is, is anything going to happen in this legislature? Is anything going to gonna happen on, in on this legislature on deregulation deregulate. of the municipalities and the uh, co-ops? I haven't seen anything filed yet, not that I'm aware of. But we don't do electricity; we do oil, so I'm not sure. I haven't seen anything filed though. Other questions, Dean. I, I just had a follow-up on this first question, and the question was: Is this opening? of the energy market in Mexico to foreign investors. Is that part of a more general liberalization of economic policy in Mexico that might benefit the middle class in Mexico and entrepreneurs in Mexico, et cetera? I, I, the, the short answer is yes. I think what you started to see in Mexico 20, 20 some odd years ago with NAFTA was a removal of tariffs the, uh, and, and the opening up of, of, of markets both to movement of goods. But what that didn't do was address the underlying issues of lack of competitiveness within the country. And so I, I think you started to see the liberalization in the market as early as the probably 80, 45, when Mexico became part of WTO during the De La Madrid administration. Then during Salinas in 88, the discussion of NAFTA, and yeah. 94, the ratification of NAFTA, which is a good example of bipartisan uh, cooperation by P President Clinton and uh, a number of Republicans actually got that done. And now you, you've moved forward and you've seen Mexico really get more competitive in manufacturing, aeronautics, automotive. And this is the, an extension of that notion that they are more market-based. In Mexico, they are a member, I think 44 different bilateral trade pacts, members of any number of multilateral organization, yeah. expanding middle class, the media. And so this is how do we as a country how does Mexico as a country uh, address the underlying issues of non-competitiveness, and that's energy and telecom and these sorts of things. So yeah, it's part of a continuing going back 20, 25 years. What's more recent, and I'll finish on, yeah. on this, is the whole notion of democracy standing up. What, what is very encouraging, when you read a piece in Mexico about protest, let's say, or you read a piece about the uh, 15 business organization taking out a full page ad in the news saying, what we have in terms of insecurity and corruption is unacceptable. That's something that you would have never seen 15 or 20 years ago in Mexico because they were they, they simply wouldn't try to hold their government accountable. So right. you're seeing both the liberalization and the democracy taking hold, which I think as a neighbor is something that, that we should view very, very favorably. Good. Sir. Uh, piggybacking on all this free trade discussion, 
Um, there was a CFR task force on North America that was released mm -hmm. uh, in the past fall. I'm sure you're probably familiar with it. And it's about like the formidability of what North America could be uh, in the future. And part of it was talking about the billions of dollars that could be saved if there was a shared smart grid across the three major nations. Is there any feasibility whatsoever? What regulations, what, what needs to be in place to sort of assure that this would work yep. uh, given the investment that would be involved and the sort of uh, you know, trade regulatory stuff? There are trilateral opportunities, are there not? And, in, and, and I, I touched on it a moment ago, because actually that report I think is a very good one. But that report I, w I would characterize as sort of laying out conceptually a direction that we need to start moving in as a, as a country and as a region in terms of our thinking. Because the, the demographics are very complementary, the trade is very complementary, the, the political systems, the democracies are very complementary. What is lacking is the thinking and the leadership in terms of how do you integrate, whether it's security and trade and these sorts of issues. Right. It was, I think, Bob Zellick and uh, General Petraeus' initiative, but it's a long ways from being the kind of thought that goes on in Washington. And so I would characterize that as a marker being put down, a thought piece put, being put down, but in, until it starts to kind of percolate and become more right. a part of the day in and day out thinking, a lot of these, it, advantages, these, these things that might be, be, be leveraged are simply going to be yeah. in CFR reports and not the stuff of Chairman, policy. Chairman, I know we're not crazy about the working with the American government. Would you be okay with working with the Canadian government and the Mexican government? No, I mean, look, we've worked, and, and I will say this, part of, your, part of your question is this, and it goes to a Keystone Pipeline problem or others. We have actually just recently with Mexico permitted two cross-country pipelines. They're both coming out of the Permian Basin private companies working in conjunction with, on both sides of the border, are permitted. But the, the process in this country to cross-country cross permit, whether it's a pipeline or utility line, which, by the way, we've got utility lines going across in, in, in between Texas and Mexico, too. We're not, we're not new to this process, but they have to have federal approval. It's very cumbersome, cumbersome expensive, and takes a long time. So. Part of what we need to have done on a federal side is streamline some of the processes and know what the rules are to begin with because the rules change for every pipeline or they're different and that's a real or cross state electricity yeah. lines. If we had rules in place with a process that was clear and not so costly that only big companies can do it, then I think you've got real opportunity to start having better partnerships across the border. Take one or two more. Sir? Yes. Or you can just use your outside voice, whichever you prefer. <laughs> More down to earth about uh, running the Railroad Commission. You have three commissioners, and uh, my understanding is uh, two of you can't get together because then you have a quorum and you have a problem. Uh, so how do you efficiently run the Railroad Commission with the current structure? We well, you know we are subject to open meetings, so that's why we can't have two of us in a room at the same time. But we're not the only agency who has this challenge, by the way, the PUC does and others. But what we really do in, in our day-to-day, -day, we have an executive director who won, I call it the, uh, the shuttle diplomacy back and forth down the hallway. But also our aides and our general, our chiefs of staff meet weekly, if not every day, and talk to each other a lot. Um, so our staffs get along very well, and we really have a lot of effective pro pro programs that we do, and we work pretty well together. And can, so you, can you Skype in together? Is that violate the public meetings? None, none, of, none, of, none of the no. above. None of the above. No so, Skyping. No. So we really do see each other on conference today. days good. about every other week. Um, but our real goal and what we've all managed to do pre-getting elected is develop the relationship. So we've got a trust, and, and as... Somebody always told me um, before I got there, not this commissioner, but another one who I, yeah, you served with him, I think, um, <laughs> wa was, um, you know, your best friend ought to be a commissioner because you, you aren't competing back and forth. You've, right. got, you've got the same goals for the state. So how you get there at the end of the day might be slightly different. But we do, we work well together. We actually, it's a very effective, efficient commission when it comes down to it. Is that it? 
want to thank you all for paying such careful attention to our guests. We're lucky to have some time with them. Please thank the Honorable Christy Craddock and the Honorable Tony Barford. <laughs>